see the Lord here is all capital letters and you realize that that is the covenant name for God as he revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush I am I am who I am the Lord is Yahweh the Lord is covenant keeping God and so the Lord here is my shepherd it's a personal very personal nature of the relationship here the Lord is my shepherd if you were to think of someone standing you would hold out your arms and you would say the Lord great is the Lord the Lord is my shepherd my shepherd how wonderful that truth to know that the covenant God who made a covenant with his people the God who created all things would seek out you and me the Lord is my shepherd I think more than the feeling that David had when he looked at the stars in Psalm 8 and he said what is man that you should be mindful of him as David looked at the creation of the Lord and he felt small I think in this psalm he looks directly at the Lord who created all things who makes his covenant with man and I think how small you must feel when you come face to face with the Lord. But then it's not a feeling of smallness when he comes face to face with the Lord. It's a feeling of comfort and joy. The Lord is not standing face to face to David. Not face to face with you and me to belittle us and making us feel small. He stands before us as a God of comfort. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I wonder if David maybe reflected on this aspect of the Lord as he was watching the sheep of his father in the field. Reflecting on his own responsibility as a shepherd to care for the sheep and then the Holy Spirit teaching him and showing him this is exactly how God behaves towards his people. directly relates to how we understand the nature of the covenant making covenant keeping God who is here called the Lord the Lord is my shepherd you see God is a shepherd to the flock we saw in this morning sermon that in the gospel of John Jesus Christ calls himself the good shepherd I am the good shepherd teaching in that same conversation with the Jewish religious leaders that a sheep a shepherd comes in by the door of the sheepfold the good shepherd teaching us what a shepherd does for the flock because we see that the good shepherd the Lord knows about shepherding and leading his people and so the Lord is my shepherd a great comfort to you and to me and to David and the phrase shepherd also links with the divinity of Christ when he says I am the good shepherd in John 10 we also know that the background to that is from Ezekiel 34 where God through the prophet Ezekiel comes against the shepherds of Israel just like Jesus came against the religious leaders in John 10 to tell them you're no shepherds you're thieves and robbers in Ezekiel 34 God comes against the religious leaders and he tells them you have not been shepherding the sheep and God commits through his prophet Ezekiel that he himself will be the shepherd of his people and he says, I will appoint one shepherd over you, David, my servant. <laughs> we then come to understand that when we say that Christ in his office of king exercises that office as a shepherd, shepherds the sheep. He's not a king like the rest of the kings of this world. He's a king who is a shepherd. This is one of the things that 
God reminds David of again and again, especially when he makes his covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. David wants to build a house for God and God reminds him, I took you from behind the sheepfolds and made you king. Will you build me a house? I've done this for you. We see then that the Lord executes his kingly office in the way that a shepherd would care for the flock. I mean, we've just now reflected on these five words, the Lord is my shepherd. And I hope that this reflection will somehow bring the weight of the next couple of words to weigh upon your hearts. Feel the sense in which David said the following words, I shall not. What else could I want if the Lord who created all things, who made a covenant with man, is my shepherd? What else is there that I can possibly desire? Like Asaph in Psalm 73 says, There is nothing on earth that I desire beside you, O Lord. What else do we want? What else do we long for? Can you see the satisfaction That it brings to our soul to know that the Lord is my shepherd. No hunger, no thirst, no priority, no pressing matter becomes more important than that feeling of contentment. I shall not (coughs) want. Everything else disappears from our sight if we are true children of the Lord and we are comforted by this fact that the Lord is my shepherd. I don't know what the circumstances are under which David wrote this psalm. But you see his circumstances disappear in the background. His soul finds contentment in this knowledge that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want (coughs) in the psalm you get the sense that David has lost everything else out of his sight and he's only coming face to face with his loving Lord who is his shepherd and he reflects solely on this notice how many times he repeats the word he, he, he See, sometimes we forget that God is a person. And especially, sometimes we forget that the Holy Spirit is a person. We affirm that the Father is a person, personal God. Jesus Christ is personally our Lord. But then we don't understand the personality of the Holy Spirit. He is God. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the words of Christ, of our good shepherd. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, our comforter that reminds us of the words. The same Holy Spirit that reminds us is the Holy Spirit that helped David pen this psalm. So that the Holy Spirit helps us to confess the same truths that David confessed. So that we can say with conviction, with full conviction, the Lord is my shepherd. Not just reciting the psalm as if from memory for the hundredth time. If I were to ask you to recite the alphabet, some of you would just go A, B, C, D, E, F without thinking. I'm not talking about reciting something that you know. I'm talking about experiencing and feeling the weight of saying and what it is that you believe there's nothing worse than to take these words and say it in an unbelieving way or in a meaningless way can they truly be meaningless and weightless to a child of God the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures 
makes me lie down in green pastures. He supplies my every need. Shall not want. It's quiet. It's peaceful. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You see the shepherd here. Not only addresses our external needs and wants. Green pastures and still waters. But he restores my soul. He supplies everything that I need externally, but way more than that. He comforts my soul. He restores my soul. How many of us have so many material blessings? We all have a roof over our heads. Not one of us has gone hungry in the last couple of weeks. If you have, please let me know. We'll get some food to you. But you get my point. None of us have gone hungry. None of us have gone without shelter. But we all can testify to some problem with our soul. We need the comfort of our soul. We need our souls restored because there are many things troubling our soul. How do I know this? Have you been to our prayer meetings recently? Have you heard the prayers of God's people? What's bothering us? Have you heard how we respond when we ask, how is it going? And can you hear the weight of the soul in the tone of the voice when people say, yeah, it's going well. We're in need of our souls being restored. He restores my soul. David tells us where we find restoration. It's not in a recipe. It's not in some axiomatic truths. We find restoration for our souls in a person and He is the Lord, the covenant God. He is Christ Jesus, our Lord. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Don't you know that you who have been baptized in Christ have been baptized into his death? You no longer live for yourself. You don't belong to yourself. You don't walk in the old ways of the flesh. You've died to the old man. The things that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians 6, immorality, homosexuality, hatred, adultery, murder, strife. And he says, such were some of you. That's past tense. Such were some of you. Yes, such were some of you. Sitting here this evening. Such were some of you. But when the covenant Lord comes and he makes you his, and when you can say this, the Lord is my shepherd. When the Holy Spirit convinces you, I am of the sheepfold of the good shepherd. The good shepherd leads me in paths of righteousness. He's not going to lead me back to my sin. He's not going to lead me back to my sin. Whatever sins we are struggling with. And sometimes I think we use that word, I struggle with my sins, as an excuse. How often have I heard I'm struggling with this sin and it's only an excuse not to repent and not to deal with it immediately. If it's a sin you know about, confess it, repent of it. You have the help of the Holy Spirit to lay it aside. And not turn to it again. How many people shrink back from repentance and faith. You see if you look at yourself and you think I'm not good enough to repent. You're never good enough to repent. Your repentance does not depend upon your goodness. Your faith does not depend upon your goodness. Or your resolve. 
or how seriously you take this message. If my salvation depended upon how serious I take things, I'd be lost forever. Because I could never take it seriously enough. But I'm thankful that I have a Lord who takes his responsibility to be a shepherd to me very seriously. You see, if the Lord treated his priorities as I treat my priorities, I wouldn't be very high up on his list. But you see, the reason that I prioritize the things of the Lord is because the Lord has prioritized being a shepherd to his people. You'll only get things straight when you look at who he is. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores me. He leads me. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And he does so for his name's sake. How wonderful that your salvation and mine brings glory to God. It's not somehow that God's glory takes priority over our salvation. But these two things are, are two sides of the same coin. You can't separate. What brings glory to God is the salvation of sinners. The salvation of sinners brings glory to God. Praise God that it works that way. Praise God that He has determined that to bring glory to His name, He will take sinners to Himself. He will shepherd a people. Now that we know who He is, what He does, verse 4, now we have reference to external circumstances. We don't know what the external circumstances are, but it's described in this way. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Whatever these circumstances were, David likens them to the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know if I'm going to make it out alive. Even though God would lead me through circumstances where I don't see the way out. Even though he leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know if I'm going to get out of this alive. And yet he doesn't panic. How many of us panic? How many of us become anxious at lesser things than death that threaten us? We tend to be anxious about small things. But you see what sort of comfort the shepherd brings that even though I should walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even if it's circumstances of this weighty nature, the psalmist says, David says, with great confidence, and we can say with great confidence, if the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to confess this, I will fear no evil. Fear no evil. For you are with me. You see what brings comfort? Not a scripture memory. Not a reciting truth to yourself. For you are with me. The psalmist here has a sense that God's presence is with him. You see, sometimes we don't feel, the God, feel God's presence in the midst of our suffering because we turn our backs on the presence of God. When God calls us into His presence for a worship service, we have other priorities. Couldn't care less where the Holy Spirit wants me to be. I'd rather do this or that. I'd excuse myself from the worship of God. I'd excuse myself from coming to meet with Him. But boy, oh boy, when I'm in trouble, I, He better, better be here. He better come. 
And I'm angry if he doesn't come immediately to rescue me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Do you savor the presence of the Lord with you? Do you prioritize time with the Lord? Do you set apart time for your daily devotions? Not resting until you've met with God. Or are you, like so many people, just turning and reading a verse and saying, oh, I didn't really pay attention, but I don't have time. If we don't have time for the Lord, it, as it, it's an indication that we don't understand that the Lord has time for us. You won't feel that comfort that the Lord has time for you if you don't have time for the Lord. You can only feel the comfort of the Lord has time for me when you have time for the Lord. Because then you're sensitive to where His presence is. And then you'll experience this. You are with me. I think it's in this way that the writer of Hebrews means it in Hebrews 4, if you will turn there. We have this terrifying picture in Hebrews 4 of the Lord's presence. In verse 12 of Hebrews 4, we hear the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and the discerning, the thoughts, and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We're exposed before Him. Standing in the nakedness and shame like Adam and Eve stood before Him in the garden. Where are you? Lord, I've sinned and therefore I hid from you. It's too afraid to come. But here is the comfort, verse 14. The writer of Hebrews makes us aware of this terrifying reality in order to comfort us. Verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He makes us aware of the presence of the Lord that we won't escape anything, escape from His sight. But He does so in order to comfort us and to encourage us to seek the presence of the Lord. Not to hide like Adam and Eve did. But to come when He calls, where are you? Hear the call of the Lord through the Holy Spirit to you this evening. Where are you? Where are you? Can you hear in that call that God is concerned for you? He's not asking, what mess did you make? What's going on here? <clears throat> He's asking you, where are you? because he doesn't know where you're hiding but he wants you to come out of hiding because that's the step of faith to trust and believe that the God who is calling you where are you is the God who wants to lead you in the path of righteousness because it's the voice of the shepherd calling you where are you it's a shepherd concerned for lost sheep that calls where are you fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me your rod and your staff they comfort me instruments of the shepherd not always meant for pleasant work when it comes to the sheep 
sheep strays, you hook him with the shepherd's staff. Your rod to beat the animals that would attack. Not all pleasant and fluffy. But if these instruments, the rod and the staff, are in the shepherd's hands, your rod and your staff, it's the rod and the staff of the shepherd. They're not the instruments of someone else. It's like we've heard this morning from John 10. The sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. To a stranger, they wouldn't listen because they don't know his voice. A stranger doesn't know how to work with these tools. The shepherd does. Don't be afraid of someone who's not a shepherd coming to you with the word of God and misusing it. They're misusing it to their own destruction. You can't destroy a sheep with the tools of the shepherd. You can't kill a Christian with the word. Christian, don't be afraid of the word of God because it's this word that brings life. We sing it in our hymns. That God pierces us with his word in order to bring life. This word is not an instrument of death to the Christian. The world would tell you that the scalpel in the hands of a skilled surgeon is the murderer seeking to take your life. How wonderful if the devil can convince you of that, that Christ seeking for your life is out to get you. Look at that big knife in his hand. But it's the knife of a surgeon. It's coming to cut away the sin because he loves you. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. Here we can apply it to us this evening. You prepare a table before me. The Lord has prepared for us this evening a table before us. Do we really believe that the ordinances instituted by Christ was instituted by the head of the church, Jesus Christ himself? Baptism and the Lord's Supper to strengthen our faith? This table is not the table of Emmaus Baptist Church. This table is not the table of an individual other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He prepares the table. Can you see him being the one who prepared? He prepared the table before us, set the table before us in the presence of my enemies. We still live in this world that hates Christ, hates his people. We have the wonderful provision of the Lord here in the midst of our enemies. We have a feast of the Lord's provision in the midst of the war, in the midst of the battle. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. God is good to me. You see, and God has not only anointed us with oil. The oil here is the shepherd would anoint, put oil on the sheep to heal the sheep, ointment for the benefit of the sheep. We've not just been anointed with oil in the physical sense, but we've been anointed with the Holy Spirit. God has put his spirit within us. Is there anything more that you can cup overflows God's provision through the Holy Spirit is more than we could ever want my cup overflows I, I can't even contain all that God wants to give me my cup overflows God gives me more blessing than I can even handle surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life Surely, listen to the confidence of the psalmist. We should also have this confidence. Surely, are you convinced that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life because you have the Lord as your shepherd? Or do you go around waiting and saying, Oh, 
Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Just waiting for the next bad thing to happen. Or even when there's something bad happening to you, saying, shall we not also receive from the Lord's hand adversity, hardship, suffering? Because we know and we trust that God works all things together for the good of those who love Him. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow Him. Even in times of difficulty. Because God is with me, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And so it's all the days of my life. How many days are there in which goodness and mercy is not a part of the daily life of the Christian? Can you point back at one of the days in your past in which God's goodness and mercy was not a part of that? Then why are you worried about tomorrow? Why are you anxious about next week or the months to come? Goodness and mercy shall follow me. It's this picture of I'm walking into the next day and right behind me is the goodness and mercy of the Lord coming with me to this day. It's the same sort of picture that Paul uses when he says that they drank from the same spiritual rock, 1 Corinthians 10. That rock followed them. The mercy and goodness of Christ is following you all the days of your life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In John 14, Jesus says, I go to my Father to prepare a place for you. Isn't this our comfort? That Jesus Christ has gone into the heavens to prepare a place for us. And so what the psalmist was longing to see when he expressed these words, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. The fulfillment of that comes as the disciples, as we the disciples now understand that Christ who has passed through the heavens is preparing a place for us that we may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. shepherd is coming to take us to himself how wonderful so we now live in the presence of our Lord and tomorrow we will know more of his comforting presence with us than we did today so that the more we come to know the Lord the more this comfort presses upon us that we have Christ who is our shepherd. Let's pray. <coughs> now Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the covenant making, covenant keeping God, the Lord our God, the Lord our shepherd. And, O oh Lord, thank you that through this psalm we can express it in this very personal way that you are my shepherd. Let this be the confession of each one of us here, each one of your people. The Lord is my shepherd. Let us then look at your provision for us, and especially, O oh Lord, at your grace of restoring our souls, leading us in the paths of righteousness, and no matter what circumstances we face in this world, to have this comfort that you are with us and that we will fear no evil. Thank you for your preparation. Help us to prepare ourselves to receive as you have called your people of old to prepare themselves for the gifts that you are about to give. Help us week by week, day by day, to prepare ourselves for the grace that we are about to receive. And so let us come expecting to receive grace from you. Let us come with confidence, 
Let us hold fast to this confidence and assurance that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. As we look forward to the consummation of all things when we shall eternally dwell with you in your house forever. Thank you, O Lord, for being our shepherd and for taking us to be your sheep.